Pursuant to Section 5 of House Resolution 5, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, for the reading of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> this morning, for the third time in the history of the House of Representatives, we will read aloud on the floor of the House the full text of the United States Constitution. It is our hope that this reading will help demonstrate to the American people that the House of Representatives is dedicated to the Constitution and the system it establishes for limited government and protection of individual liberty. We also hope that it will inspire many more Americans to read the Constitution themselves. The text we will read today reflects the changes to the document made by the 27 amendments to it. Those portions superseded by amendment will not be read. In order to ensure fairness to all those interested in participating, we have asked members to line up to be recognized on a first-come, first-served basis. I will recognize members based on this guidance. Each member will approach the podium and read the passage laid out for him or her. In order to ensure relative parity and fairness, I may recognize members out of order in order to ensure bipartisanship and balance. Additionally, because of his long-term leadership on civil rights issues, I will recognize Representative John Lewis to read the 13th Amendment. I want to thank the members of both parties for their participation in this historic event, and I will begin by recognizing Speaker Boehner to read the preamble of the Constitution. I want to thank my colleague for yielding. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Article 1, Section 1. All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. I now yield to the Majority Leader, the gentleman from California, Mr. McCarthy. Thank the gentleman for yielding. Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states and the electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. I now yield to the gentleman from Maryland, the minority whip, Mr. Hoyer. No shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25 years and been seven years a citizen of the United States and who shall not when elected, be an inhabitant of that state in which he shall be chosen. The actual enumeration shall be made within three years after the first meeting of the Congress of the United States, and within every subsequent term of 10 years in such manners as they shall by law direct. I now yield to the gentleman from Louisiana, the majority whip, Mr. Scalise. Thank the gentleman from Virginia. The number of representatives shall not exceed one for every 30,000, but each state shall have at least one representative. And until such enumeration shall be made, the state of New Hampshire shall be entitled to choose three, Massachusetts eight, Rhode Island and Providence plantations one, Connecticut five, New York six, New Jersey four, Pennsylvania eight, Delaware one, Maryland six, Virginia 10, North Carolina five, South Carolina 5, and Georgia 3. I now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen. And in the representation from any state, the executive authority thereof shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. The House of Representatives shall choose their speaker and other officers and have the sole power of impeachment. Now yield to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, WNL graduate Chairman Goodlatte. Section three, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state 
for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. Immediately after they shall be assembled in consequence of the first election, they shall be divided as equally as may be into three classes. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi. The seats of the senators of the first class shall be vacated at the expiration of the second year of the second class at the expiration of the fourth year and the third class at the expiration of the six years, so that one third may be chosen every second year. I now yield to the gentlewoman from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. No person shall be a senator who shall not have attained to the age of 30 years and been nine years a citizen of the United States, and who shall not, when elected, be an inhabitant of that state for which he shall be chosen. I now yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch. The Vice President of the United States shall be President of the Senate but shall have no vote unless they be equally divided. The Senate shall choose their other officers and also a president pro tempore in the absence of the vice president or when he shall exercise the office of president of the United States. And now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Fleischman. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments when sitting for that purpose. They shall be on oath or affirmation. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. And no person shall be convicted without the concurrence of two-thirds of the members present. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Dingell. Judgment in cases of impeachment shall not extend further than to be for removal from office and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. But the party convicted shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to law. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Marino. Thank you, Chairman. Section 4, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Joy Speedy. Each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members. And a majority of each shall constitute a quorum to do business. But a smaller number may adjourn from day to day and may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Costello. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings punish its members from disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. I now yield to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same, except such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy. 
and the yeas and nays of the members of either house on any question shall, at the desire of one-fifth of those present, be entered on the journal. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Wenstrup. Neither House, during the session of Congress, shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two Houses shall be sitting. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott. Section 6. The senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the Treasury of the United States. They shall, in all cases except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Latta. No senator or representative shall during the, the time for which he was elected be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time, and no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either House during his continuance in office. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Oregon, Ms. Bonanici. Section 7. All bills for raising revenue shall originate in the House of Representatives, but the Senate may propose or concur with amendments as on other bills. I now yield to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie. Every bill which shall have passed the House of Representatives and the Senate shall, before it become a law, be presented to the President of the United States. If he approve, he shall sign it. But if, if not, he shall return it with his objections to that House in which it shall have originated, who shall enter the objections at large on their journal and proceed to reconsider it. Now you have the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Walls. If after such reconsideration, two-thirds of that House shall agree to pass the bill, it shall be sent, together with the objections, to the other House, by which it shall likewise be reconsidered. And if approved by two-thirds of that House, it shall become law. I now yield to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Hill. But in all such cases, the votes of both houses shall be determined by the yeas and nays, and the names of the persons voting for and against the bill shall be entered on the journal of each house, respectively. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pascrell. If any bill shall not be returned by the President within 10 days, Sundays accepted, after it shall have been presented to him, the same shall be a law in like manner as if he had signed it, unless the Congress by their adjournment prevent its return, in which case it shall not be a law. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Benishek. Every order, resolution, or vote to which the concurrence of the Senate and House of Representatives may be necessary, except on a question of adjournment, shall be presented to the President of the United States, and before the same shall take effect, shall be approved by him, or being disapproved by him, shall be repassed by two-thirds of the Senate and House of Representatives, according to the rules and limitations prescribed in the case of the bill. 
I now yield to the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Kaptur. Section 8. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay the debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Henserling. To borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes, to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies throughout the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. To coin money, regulate the value thereof and of foreign coin, and fix the standard of weights and measures, to provide for the punishment of counterfeiting the securities and current coin of the United States, to establish post offices and post roads. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Hawaii, Ms. Gabbard. To constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court, to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lance. to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Allen. To declare a war, grant letters of Mark T in reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. To raise and support armies, but no appropriation of money to that use shall be for a longer term than two years. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Graham. To provide and maintain a navy, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces, to provide for calling forth the militia, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. I now yield to the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Newhouse. To provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, reserving to the states respectively the appointment of officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. I now yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Serrano. To exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever, or with such district not exceeding 10 miles square, as may be by session of particular states and in the acceptance of Congress, become the seat of the government of the United States, and to exercise the like authority over all places purchased by the consent of the legislature of the state in which the same shall be, for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. 
I now yield to the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith. And to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. Section 9. The migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1808 but a tax or duty may be imposed on such importation, not exceeding $10 for each person. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. The privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. No bill of attainder or ex post facto law shall be passed. No captation or other direct tax shall be laid unless in proportion to the census or the enumeration herein before directed to be taken. No tax or duty shall be laid on articles exported from any state. I now yield to the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce. I thank the gentleman. No preference shall be given by any regulation of commerce or revenue to the ports of one state over those of another, nor shall vessels bound to or from one state be obliged to enter, clear, or pay duties in another. No money shall be drawn from the Treasury, but in consequence of appropriations made by law, and a regular statement and account of the receipts and expenditures of the public money shall be published from time to time. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Michigan, Ms. Lawrence. No title of nobility shall be granted by the United States, and no person holding any office of profit or trust under them shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept any present emolument office or title of kind whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. Section 10. No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters, or mark, and reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver corn a tenure and payment of debts, pass any bill of attainder, ex post factual law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts or grant of any nobility. I now yield to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Byrne. No state shall, without the consent of the Congress, lay any imposts or duties on imports or exports except what may be absolutely necessary for executing its inspection laws, and the net produce of all duties and imposts laid by any state on imports or exports shall be for the use of the Treasury of the United States, and all such laws shall be subject to the revision and control of the Congress. No state shall, without the consent of Congress, lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter into any agreement or compact with another state or with a foreign power, or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Kelly. Thank you. Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. He should hold his office on the term of four years and together with the vice president chosen for the same term be elected as follows. 
each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors equal to the whole number of senators and representatives to which the state may be entitled in the Congress, but no senator or representative or person holding an office or trust or profit under the United States shall be appointed an elector. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Forbes. The Congress may determine the time of choosing the electors and the day on which they shall give their votes, which day shall be the same throughout the United States. No person except a natural born citizen or citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of the Constitution shall be eligible to the office of President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained to the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano. The President shall, at stated times, receive for his services a compensation which shall neither be increased or, nor diminished during the period for which he shall have been elected. And he shall not receive within that period any other emolument from the United States or any of them. Before he enter on the execution of his office, he shall take the following oath or affirmation. I do solemnly swear or affirm that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Paulson. Section 2. The President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. He may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer in each of the executive departments upon any subject relating to the duties of their respective offices. And he shall have power to grant reprieves and pardons for offenses against the United States except in cases of impeachment. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Capps. He shall have power, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, to make treaties, provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And he shall nominate, and by and with the advice and consent of the Senate, shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and councils, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States whose appointments are not herein otherwise provided for, and which shall be established by law. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Rothfuss. But the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior offices as they think proper in the President alone, in the courts of law, or in the heads of departments. The President shall have power to fill up all vacancies that may happen during the recess of the Senate by granting commissions which shall expire at the end of their next session. I now yield to the gentlewoman from New Mexico, Ms. Lujan Grisham. Hilarious. He shall, from time to time, give the Congress information of the State of the Union and recommend to their consideration such measures as he shall judge necessary and expedient. He may, on extraordinary occasions, convene both houses or either of them, and in the case of disagreement between them with respect to the time of adjournment, he may adjourn them to such time as he shall think proper. I now yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Rowe. 
shall receive ambassadors and other public ministers. He shall take care of the laws, be faithfully executed, and shall commission all the officers of the United States. Section 4. The President, Vice President, and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribe, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. I now yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Nadler. Article 3, Section 1. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judges, both of the Supreme and inferior courts, shall hold their offices during good behavior and shall at stated times receive for their services a compensation which shall not be diminished during their continuance in office. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Bishop. The judicial power shall extend to all cases in law and equity arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, and the treaties made, or which shall be made under their authority, to all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, to all cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Kirkpatrick. To controversies to which the United States shall be a party, to controversies between two or more states, between citizens of different states, between citizens of the same state claiming lands under grants of different states, and between a state or the citizens thereof and foreign states, citizens, or subjects. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry. In all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, and those which a state shall be party, the Supreme Court shall have original jurisdiction. In all other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact, with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make. I now yield to the gentlewoman from I now yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. The trial of all crimes, except in cases of impeachment, shall be by jury, and such trial shall be held in the state where the said crimes shall have been committed. But when not committed within any state, the trial shall be at such place or places as the Congress may by law have directed. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Tennessee, Ms. Black. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. No person shall be convicted of treason unless on the testimony of two witnesses to the same overt act or on the confession in open court. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Costa. The Congress shall have the power to declare the punishment of treason, but no attainer of treason shall work corruption of blood or forfeiture except during the life of the person attained. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Hurt. Article 4, Section 1, full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. And the Congress may, by general laws, prescribe the manner in which such acts, records, and proceedings shall be proved and the effect thereof. 
I now yield to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor. The citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states. A person charged in any state with treason, felony, or other crime who shall flee from justice and be found in another state shall on demand of the executive authority of the state from which he fled be delivered up to be removed to the state having jurisdiction of the crime. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Section 3. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union, but no new state shall be formed or erected within the jurisdiction of any other state, nor any state be formed by the junction of two or more states or parts of states without the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned as well as of the Congress. I now yield to the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Lipinski. The Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory or other property belonging to the United States. And nothing in this Constitution shall be so construed as to prejudice any claims of the United States or any particular state. I now yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Zeldin. The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive when the legislature cannot be convenient against domestic violence. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott. The Congress, whenever two-thirds of both houses shall deem it necessary, shall propose amendments to this Constitution or on the application of the legislatures or of two-thirds of the several states shall call a convention for proposing amendments which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution. When ratified by the legislature of three-fourths of the several states. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Heiss. or by conventions in three-fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, provided that no amendment which may be made prior to the year 1808 shall in any manner affect the first and fourth clauses in the ninth section of the first article, and that no state without its consent shall be deprived of its equal suffrage in the Senate. Chair, the, uh, I, I'm now pleased to yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Vargas. Article 6, all debts contracted and engagements entered into before the adoption of this Constitution shall be as valid against the United States under this Constitution as under the Confederation. I now yield to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Abraham. This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof, and all treaties made, or what shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land, and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Castro.
The senators and representatives before mentioned and the members of the several state legislatures and all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states, shall be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. Now I yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Mr. Lowenthal. Article 7, the ratification of the conventions of nine states shall be sufficient for the establishment of this constitution between the states, so ratifying the same. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Mullinar. Done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states, present the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1,780, 87, and of the independence of the United States of America, the 12th in witness whereof we have hereunto subscribed our names. I now yield to the uh, gentlewoman from Connecticut, Ms. Esty. George Washington, President and Deputy from Virginia. From Delaware, George Reed, Gunning Bedford, Jr., John Dickinson, Richard Bassett, Jacob Broom. Maryland, James McHenry, Daniel of St. Thomas, Jennifer, Daniel Carroll. Virginia, John Blair, James Madison, Jr. And now you to the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walden. Thank the gentleman. From North Carolina, William Blount, Richard Dobbs Spate, Hugh Williamson. South Carolina, John Rutledge, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, Charles Pinckney, Pierce Butler. Georgia, William Few, Abraham Baldwin. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. McNerney. New Hampshire, John Langdon, Nicholas Gilman, Massachusetts, Nathaniel Gorman, Rufus King, Connecticut, William Samuel Johnson, Roger Sherman, New York, Alexander Hamilton. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Roby. New Jersey, William Livingston, David Brearley, William Patterson, Jonathan Dayton. Pennsylvania, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Mifflin, Robert Morris, George Clymer, Thomas Fitz Fitzsimmons, Gerald Ingersoll, James Wilson, and Governor Morris. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Hahn. Amendment 1. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. That's a great one. I now yield to the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. Jenkins. Amendment 2. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. I read from the Third Amendment of the 
Bill of Rights of the United States Constitution, no soldier shall in time of peace be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. I now yield to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Rouser. Amendment 4, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. I now yield to the gentleman from Delaware, Mr. Carney. Amendment 5, no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger. I now yield to the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Franks. Nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be put twice in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. Amendment 6. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law. The gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu. And to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Wolarski. Amendment 7. In suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise reexamined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Washington, the Republican Conference Chair, Ms. McMorris-Rogers. Amendment 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. I now yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Perlmutter. The Ninth Amendment to the Constitution, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Pitts. Amendment 10. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Franklin. The judicial power of the United States 
shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizens or subjects of any foreign state. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Flores. Amendment 12, the electors shall meet in their respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president and in distinct ballots the person voted for as vice president. I now yield to the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Ellison. And they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president and of all persons voted for as vice president and of the number of votes for each, which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate. I now yield to the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Stewart. The President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives, open all of the certificates and the votes shall then be counted. The person having the greatest number of votes for President shall be the President, if such number be a majority of the whole number of the electors appointed. And if no person have such majority, then from the persons having the highest number not exceeding three on the list of those voted for as President. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Davis. The House of Representatives shall choose immediately by ballot the president. But in choosing the president, the vote shall be taken by states, the representation from each state having one vote. A quorum for this purpose shall consist of a member or members from two thirds of the states, and a majority of all the states shall be necessary to a choice. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Granger. The person having the greatest number of votes as vice president shall be the vice president, if such number be a majority of the whole number of electors appointed. And if no person have a majority, then from the two highest numbers on the list, the Senate shall choose the vice president. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Songus. A quorum for the purpose shall consist of two-thirds of the whole number of senators, and a majority of the whole number shall be necessary to a choice. But no person constitutionally ineligible to the office of president shall be eligible to that of vice president of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The 13th Amendment, Section 1, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, where are the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Section 2, Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Utah, Ms. Love. Amendment 14, Section 1. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the states wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. I now yield to the gentleman from, 
from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline. Amendment 14, Section 2. Representatives shall be apportioned among the several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state, excluding Indians not taxed. I now yield to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Heisinga. But when the right to vote at any election for the choice of electors for President and Vice President of the United States, representatives in Congress, the executive and judicial officers of a state, or the members of the legislature thereof is denied to any of the male inhabitants of such state being 21 years of age and citizens of the United States or in any abridged any way abridged except for participation in rebellion or other crime and the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the number a proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in such state. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States. I now yield to the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr. or as a member of any state legislature, or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by a vote of two-thirds of each House, remove such disability. I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Valadeo. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fatah. Thank you. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in the aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, the Minority Leader, Ms. Pelosi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Section 5, the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Amendment 15, Section 1, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. I now yield to the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Yoder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, section 2, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Amendment 16, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived without apportionment among the several states and without regard to any census or enumeration. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Maryland, Ms. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Amendment 17, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators from each state, elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislatures. When vacancies happen in the representation of any state in the Senate, 
the executive authority of such state shall issue writs of election to fill such vacancies. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Indiana, Ms. Brooks. Provided that the legislature of any state may empower the executive thereof to make temporary appointments until the people fill the vacancies by election as the legislature may direct. This amendment shall not be so construed as to affect the election or term of any senator chosen before it becomes valid as part of the Constitution. I now yield to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Walters. Amendment 19. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Sewell. Amendment 20, Section 1. The terms of the President and the Vice President shall end at noon on the 20th day of January, and the terms of Senator and Representatives at, the, at noon on the 3rd day of January, of the year in which such terms would have ended if this article had not been ratified, and the terms of their successors shall then begin. I now yield to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. Section 2. The Congress shall assemble at least once in every year, and such meetings shall begin at noon on the third day of January, unless they shall, by law, appoint a different day. I now yield to the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Section 3. If at the time fixed for the beginning of the term of the president, the president-elect shall have died, the vice president-elect shall become president. If a president shall not have been chosen before the time fixed for the beginning of his term, or if the president-elect shall have failed to qualify, then the vice president-elect shall act as president until a president shall have qualified. I now yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith. And the Congress may by law provide for the case wherein neither a president-elect nor a vice president shall have qualified, declaring who shall then act as president, or the manner in, in which one who is to act shall be selected, and such person shall act accordingly until a president or vice president shall have qualified. Now I yield to the gentleman from Vermont, Mr. Welch. The, section 4. The Congress may by law provide for the case of the death of any of the persons from whom the House of Representatives may choose a president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them. And for the case of the death of any of the persons from whom the Senate may choose a vice president whenever the right of choice shall have devolved upon them. Now I yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock. Section 5. Sections 1 and 2 shall take effect on the 15th day of October following the ratification of this article. Section 6. This article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission. Now I yield to the gentleman from New York, Mr. Maloney. Amendment 21, Section 1. The 18th Article of Amendment to the Constitution of the United States is hereby repealed. Section 2. The transportation or importation into any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of the laws thereof is hereby prohibited. Now I yield to the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Pittenger. 
Section three, this article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by conventions in the several states as provided in the Constitution within seven years from the date of the submission hereof to the states by the Congress. I now yield to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Amendment 22, Section 1. No person shall be elected to the office of the President more than twice, and no person who has held the office of President or acted as President for more than two years of a term of which some other person was elected President shall be elected to the office of President more than once. Now yield to the gentleman from Alabama, Mr. Palmer. But this article shall not apply to any person holding the office of president when this article was proposed by Congress and shall not prevent any person who may be holding the office of president or acting as president during the term within which this article becomes operative from holding the office of president or acting as president during the remainder of such term. Now yield to the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Plaskett. This, this article shall be inoperative unless it shall have been ratified as an amendment to the Constitution by the legislatures of three-fourths of the several states within seven years from the date of its submission to the states by the Congress. Yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tipton. Amendment 23, Section 1. The district constituting the seat of government of the United States shall appoint in such manner as Congress may direct a number of electors of president and vice president equal to the whole number of senators and representatives in Congress to which the district would be entitled if it were a state, but in no event more than the least populous state. I now yield to the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Buck. They shall be in addition to those appointed by the states, but they shall be considered for the purposes of the election of president and vice president to be electors appointed by a state, and they shall meet in the district and perform such duties as provided by the 12th article of amendment. Section two, the Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Joyce. Amendment 24, Section 1. The rights of the citizens of the United States to vote in any primary or other election for president or vice president, for electors for president or vice president, or for senator or representative in Congress shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state by reason of failure to pay poll tax or other tax. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. I now yield to the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Lobiondo. Amendment 25, Section 1, in case of the removal of a president from office or of his death or resignation, the vice president shall become president. Section 2, whenever there is a vacancy in the office of vice president, the president shall nominate a vice president who shall take the oath upon confirmation by a majority vote of both House and Congress. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green. Thank you. Section three, whenever the president transmits to the president pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that he is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office and until he transmits them a written declaration to the contrary, such powers and duties shall be discharged by the vice president as acting president. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Section four, 
whenever the vice president and a majority of either the principal officers of the executive departments or such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit to the president pro tempore of the Senate and to the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president shall immediately assume the powers and duties of the office as acting president. I now yield to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Rackus. Thereafter, when the President transmits to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives his written declaration that no inability exists, he shall resume the powers and duties of this office unless the Vice President and a majority of either the principal officers of the Executive Department or such other body as Congress may by law provide, transmit within four days to the President pro tempore of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives their written declaration that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Hurd. Thereupon, Congress shall decide the issue, assembling within 48 hours for that purpose, if not in session. If the Congress within 21 days after receipt of the latter written declaration, or if Congress is not in session, within 21 days after Congress is required to assemble, determines by two-thirds vote of both houses that the President is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office. The Vice President shall continue to discharge the same as Acting President. Otherwise, the President shall resume the powers and duties of his office. I now yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat. Amendment 26, Section 1. The right of citizens of the United States who are 18 years of age or older to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of age. I now yield to the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Westerman. Section 2. The Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. I now yield to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Vesey. Amendment 27. No law varying the compensation for the services of the senators and representatives shall take effect until, until an election of representatives shall have intervened. Virginia seek recognition. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that I be allowed to revise and extend remarks and insert omitted material in the record during the reading of the Constitution. Without objection.